if midway through this long, lovely, in-depth conversation, you want to move and be more comfortable, this button here yeah. mutes your microphone. Okay. And you can see the light will go off. Yeah. Okay. And you can kind of readjust. Stuff. Okay, perfect. Cough, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Um, so you don't have one of those. No, I don't. Because you have... Because um, I have the nauseous chair going around. Well, you've also got... Clinton is you. Oh, yeah. Chair, so here, off so I could, yeah, right. and on. Cool. But it might be easier for, to not with these ones. You just no, I'm not going to touch it, buddy. <laughs> no, I'm just checking that we're recording. Everything's all good. Too. Yeah, we're 100%. We are Brilliant. good to, to go. Thanks, Sammy. No worries. Appreciate that, buddy. Pleasure. So I would have done the intro. Yeah, okay. up, you've given me those, those points to kind of give people a sense of what it is that you do and sure. how big it is. Brilliant. So, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, Chris. Wonderful, thank you. Paint us a picture of a typical month in the life of Chris Gray. Well, it's the kind of things that's probably going to annoy a lot of people. I'm one of, one of those people that uh, go that way. So look, typically I go overseas once a month. So I try and do about 10 to 15 trips a year overseas. Uh, generally business related, but I'm doing it with people that I, I love and, uh, and love hanging around with. Um, probably do a couple of interstates, and I've got a new plan for this year, which is basically no meetings in the morning. Genius. Yeah, I, Genius. I should have thought about it years ago. Because <laughs> yes. a lot of people take Thursdays and Fridays off, and I thought, look, that's not mega, let's just clear mornings. So basically seven to eight is just clear the email, so all those kind of disappear and that's set up for the day. Eight to nine is actually trying to play with my kids and actually do board games. And I'm, I'm not a natural dad, so I need to sit myself down and actually physically do something with them. Drop them there, off. There's a massive assumption there that kids want to play board games at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, morning. I know. <laughs> so my daughter's probably still sleeping, so she doesn't really do it. But I'm just trying to spend some time with my son. Yeah. And like we play Monopoly and, and things like that, which he loves. Uh, drop them at school at nine. Do the gym from nine till 10, 10.30. And then do a stretching or a massage class from like 10.30 to 11.30. And then go home and then set up for 12 o'clock and it's time for lunch. And probably have a couple of meetings in the afternoon and then most evenings I'm out. So uh, Mondays I do Sky News and then Tuesday to Thursday and Friday generally some kind of networking or event that I might be speaking at or going along to. And then kind of Saturday and Sunday with the family. So it's just variety really. Yeah, so, so you're starting work at midday or shortly thereafter, but you're working into the night. So you might be taking mornings off, but you're still working a relatively yeah. normal eight, nine hour a day, so look, for all doing the, what you love. Yeah, so for all the small businesses, we all know it's 24-7. Mm -hmm. You've got your own business, there is an on and off. You're always thinking about the business. And so it's more just to try and set aside time to get fit because I, I drink a lot, I'm out a lot, I'm entertaining, and I don't love fitness, so I've got to force myself to do it. And so most of the time, even if I'm down the gym, technically I'm networking. Like My cars are plastered with advertising all over it, so I'm almost a walking billboard 24-7 anyway. So uh, so quite often, if you ask my wife, she'll say he works 24-7. If you ask my friends, they'll say he never works. And if you ask the tax man, then maybe it's 50-50. Yeah, right, OK. <laughs> well, you've certainly built a business that you love. So where'd the idea for your empire come from? Sure. So I'm an accountant by trade. I'm not a great accountant. <sighs> oh, sorry. Exactly. Right, lost me there. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I was just good naturally with numbers. So basically, at 22, I worked out... I couldn't afford a one bedroom unit because it would take all my wages to pay the mortgage, but I could afford a three bedroom house because I could rent two rooms out uh -huh. and even though the mortgage was more than my wages, I could live for free. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my skill base. So basically I gave up work at 31 out of Deloitte's. I tried a salary sacrifice a Ferrari and they worked out the fringe benefits tax was more than my wages. <laughs> so they knew something yeah, was wrong there. But basically I was paying it out of property profits. And so I basically didn't work for a few years and everyone said, well, how come you're not working? You've got, you drive Ferraris, so you've got a boat, you live on the beach, you're not working. So I started telling people my story and people believed me because I didn't have any vested interest. So I didn't sell the mortgages uh, or houses because I had no job. Yes. And so from there, then I started doing courses because people said, well, can you teach us a bit more? And then from doing the courses, then the CEO just said to me, look, I don't want to learn how to do this stuff. I don't want to deal with the agents. Can I pay you? Will you do it for me? And that's really where a business started. So it all so, came so out of demand. That sounded so incredibly easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. Oh, so, wasn't. Yeah, at, yeah. At, at, just going back, at 22, you in Australia or England? In the UK. In the UK. So at 22, you, you want to get your own home. Yeah. Right? You go, well, I can't afford to just have one that I only live in, but the idea of having one with two extra bedrooms that generate revenue through getting tenants in and I live for free, 
So you get your own home, you get your first home. Yeah. That, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. You're at Deloitte. For the next nine years, you are, a, you, you are trapped, a, trapped in a cubicle working for the man, but you are continuing to buy property yourself? Yeah, so I bought basically six over that time. And so this, this was the, I think, the clever thing. So Deloitte's normally at six hour, kind of, you know, recording the six minute uh, oh, yeah. intervals. Not that we ever did that. But I basically had a really cool boss, uh, Deborah. I'll give, it, give her a plug. She was a good boss. I think Deborah and, listens, actually. <laughs> and we basically had an agreement that if I got my work done, I could do my property investing on the side. What a cool boss. So I became the most efficient person around Deloitte's because I knew if anyone ever complained that I hadn't done my work, I'd lose that privilege. Sure. And I said, you don't need to pay me bonuses. You don't need to try and motivate me. I'm self-motivated. I'm going to be so out there. So I wasn't on email. I wasn't on Facebook doing all that kind of stuff, sitting around chatting because I'm trying to get my work done in 20 hours so I could then be out with the solicitors or looking at properties and doing everything else. And so that's basically the mentality I had. What do you think about that mentality that Deborah so very courageously and probably pretty smartly said, you, know, you, you do get your work done here and then do whatever you want to. But also, do you... I, I don't know if she had any choice. Yeah, right, she was going to lose you. Because the other thing was, is with staff bonuses, she says, we go and pay someone five grand for working hard all year, we change their life. You go and buy another set of tyres on the Ferrari. <laughs> because at the time, I was earning 80 grand a year, which is 60 grand after tax. Same time from, this was early 2000s, so the property market was growing. I was making 600 grand a year, capital gains, so I wasn't paying tax because I wasn't selling. So you earn 60 grand for working or 600 grand for doing nothing, and that's the reality. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for them to motivate an employee that doesn't need money. Mm -hmm. Because everyone else, you either threaten to sack them or you give them the carrot of uh, a bonus. And this is what I'm kind of against with, say, a normal employee relationship or when small business have staff. There's no incentive for that person to really work any harder. Whereas I was the most kind of energetic person there because I had a reason to do something. That it wasn't getting a little bonus, it was making hundreds and hundreds of thousands from property investing. How many staff have you got now? So technically I've got none and I've got no office. But we effectively all work from home because I don't want to come into the city every day. I work in or I live in Darling Point. We've got 360 degree views around Sydney. So we're in a round building, whole floor. So why would I want to... This is a home. This is a home, a rented home. And so why would I ever want to go and have an office? And then staff, I learned from Deloitte's, is first of all, you've got to pay them. Then you've got to hope that they do some work. Then you hope that they don't sue you or leave or do nick all your customers. <laughs> and so in real estate, it's quite different anyway. Is effectively, everyone runs their own business, but under my banner or under, under my uh, logos. Huh. And they're all effectively self-employed. Huh. So if they want to earn money, they can earn a million dollars if they want. But... I don't care if they work 100 hours or 1,000 hours or two hours. It's all about you put money in the bank and we all split it. And if you're super efficient and you can generate more money in less time, you get paid more money per hour. Genius. And so it's, it's just like running a business. It's, if you've got a great business, you earn lots of money. Mm -hmm. If you go in and do 80 hours a week but you don't actually generate any business, you don't get paid. So uh, at 31, you've got six properties under your belt. It's time to leave Deloitte. Yeah. What, what was that decision? Was that just like, you know what, I don't need Deloitte anymore and, you know, it's time to do my own thing? So I actually, it was actually a really hard decision because I've been brought up, my dad was a doctor, mum was a nurse, I was brought up as a job for life and I actually needed a life coach and life coaches were only just invented back in early yeah. 2000s and I, I still think that the life coach that I had still doesn't know what I did but it was her mentality that got me over the mindset of leaving work. So I thought I earn 60 grand a year, so five grand a month. If I go and put, say, 60 grand in a bank account and pay myself five grand a month, it's the same as having a job, but not turning up. And it was that mentality that I needed to leave the workforce. Huh. Because everyone's reaction when I email from Deloitte saying I've, I've retired, it's, oh, you can't do that, you need a job. Like, there's all the negativity and, oh no, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm. But the mentality was, well, was, if I'm getting five grand a month, who cares whether I turn up to an office? Exactly. And one year led to two, to three, and then suddenly, 15 years later, still haven't had a proper job. <laughs> Unemployable, probably. Exactly. So, so you, you leave Deloitte. Uh, how long, you didn't have the idea for your empire, the business, at that point in time? No, so what I did is, um, a mate of mine was trying to get into filmmaking, and he started doing extras work. 
you know, how to, hanging out on film sets and, and movies. One of the great miniseries, by the way, with Ricky <laughs> Gervais too. Love yeah. it. And, and I turned up and I think you had to pay 200 bucks for your pictures or something. And I said, look, I don't want to be on TV. I don't want to act. I'm not an actor. I don't want to say anything. I just want to see how you make a movie or an advert or something like that. And you spend all this time kind of hanging out and you're just talking to people. And I used to give my free property advice, as I always, always do. And one of the guys found a lead through his agency that Channel 9 were after a, uh, a property expert to go on um, a show called My Home TV, a, a packer thing. And um, in short, I basically got the job a few years later. And um, we did, I think, 37 shows on Saturday mornings, a lifestyle show. So we got to Queensland, they put a house on the back of a truck and move it somewhere. Oh, yeah. We do all these amazing things. And so I just built the reputation of being the independent expert because I didn't have a barrier to push. Yeah, right. And, and that, that's the big thing, because everyone that has got a barrier to push, everyone's got a vested interest in giving you the certain advice. So I guess I always wanted to be that corporate speaker rather than, I guess, the spruker. And my market always was high income earners rather than, I guess, your average Aussie in a way. And so um, I just built it up from being a, a TV expert, I so guess. So you're literally just living a, a luxurious life of not working at this point in time. The TV opportunity comes along and you take it. And yeah. it was at that point where there was some enough people were asking for advice and how do you do what you do that you think, you know what, I'm going to turn this into a business. And, and, and also the same thing is, is, so I had about three and a half million of property then that was going up at, say, 10, 20% a year. So I was making that 600, but I knew that 600 wasn't going to last. And suddenly if you don't work, you've then got 24 seven to spend. And so suddenly your expenses go up. Okay. And so I just could see that, look, maybe I need a bigger portfolio than three and a half million to, uh, to retire on. Because one of the things I look at, looking at your business, I go, why, do, why go and show other people how to do it when you could just continue to do it yourself? Enjoy the fruits of that and not have clients and businesses to worry about or, you know, contractors. Yeah, so in the early days you go through the tough times, whereas now, because I've been in it for 10 years, I've got the easy side, so I don't deal with most of the stuff now, which is great. But the reality is with property is two things is, first of all is, if I'm building the relationship with the agents to try and get off market deals, it's a lot of work just, even I, I can only buy one or two a year at the most. So if I'm investing that much time in a relationship, I may as well be buying 50 or 100. Mm, okay. For that same relationship effectively. Yeah, yeah. And it's easier to get better deals if I'm buying in bulk 50 or 100 properties than I'm just buying one. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. The second part of it is, in the good old days of 2000s, you could get no doc or low doc loans. Tick a box, you can get an 80% loan. Now the banks are an absolute nightmare because of APRA, and so now you've got to have an income. So even if you've got a million dollar debt free property, you still need an income to pull the mortgage out. Mm -hmm. So effectively the business is the income side of my business and it pays all my expenses, my travel, all that kind of stuff, but the real money comes from the property investing. So explain your empire now, how does it work? Sure. So effectively what we do is we help people create wealth from property. And typically we're dealing with high income earners that want to buy in the blue chip suburbs. So we're not trying to find the latest, greatest thing. We're not trying to suddenly do a granny flat or subdivide or take massive risks. Um, because quite often hotspots don't turn into a hotspot and they, they crash, like the mining towns. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to buy that Bondi Beach, the St Kilda, Paran type thing. And we're trying to say we're buying it today for half a million or a million bucks. And we think in seven or 10 years, it's gonna be worth two million. But you go to auction, there's 20 or 30 people over it, it'll go for 1.1 rather than a million dollars. We can get it for a million dollars and buy it before it comes on the market. How? So by basically- <laughs> This is your secret sauce. <laughs> no, so it's not a secret. It's basically having that relationship. So our biggest thing is, is we're ethical, we're honest, and we do what we say we're gonna do. So say you've bought a, say you're a vendor, so you own your own home, cost you 500, it's now worth a million. And an agent says, I could sell it to you for 1.1 at auction, which is great. Sell it for you. Sell it for you yeah. for 1.1. But you've suddenly seen your dream property or, or your partner has, and it goes to auction in one or two weeks. And you don't want people coming through the house and you want that certainty. If I come up and say, I'll give you a million dollars now, it's guaranteed. Now, sure, you might get 1.1 at auction, but if you only get 999, you're gonna lose your dream home. Mm -hmm. What do you wanna do? So, now, so how, how are you approaching that vendor? Are you saying through the agents, effectively. And so we're saying the same thing to the agents, is you're super busy, you're, you're selling 20 properties. 
whether you sell it for one or one point one, you get you get the, the same commission. Yeah. And so it really doesn't make any difference. So we're the guarantee. And so the the easy analogy is is when you sell a second hand car, do most people do it themselves or do they trade it in? Mm -hmm. They trade right. it in. Why do they do it? Because they hate dealing with tar kickers. Do you get the best price at trade in? No, you no. don't. It's a guaranteed deal. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. Same, same. Yeah. Genius. So everyone thinks that everyone's after the, the highest dollar or the cheapest the kind of thing. It's never the case. Never? Oh, not never, but pretty much. Not every vendor has got a dream property in mind that's going to auction in two weeks so that sure. you can come in and be the But a lot of night. people don't want the neighbours to find out. They might go through a divorce. Right. They just don't want the grief. They don't want to deal with agents. They might come to us direct. There's a whole host of different reasons of why you just don't want the grief. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like the same for employees. Does every employee go for the highest paying job? No, not necessarily. Sometimes they just want... Jobs they love. Yeah, they want to work at Google or, or where it's, it's kind of better lifestyle living. Mm -hmm. So this is the whole thing about any kind of sales or marketing is you're trying to go for something that's it's not all price. If you're selling on price, you've got a pretty screwed up business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a one-way street really, isn't it? Yeah. Unless you're a Bing Lee or something like that, you're making millions. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> so, so, okay, so right now, your empire, you're out there, you're finding sourcing properties um, off the plan, talking to developers, going to vendors. No, so most of the time we're just buying second hand. Right. So again, we're not even taking the punt on brand new and taking the risk that it will be built because we think most of the good areas are already fully built up. So they can only build in the secondary areas. We don't want to buy in the secondary areas. We mm. want the, the blue chips. And if you can buy in the blue chips, they'd sell it for two million, which is then hasn't got a great yield. Mm -hmm. So we're not buying the super sexy, gorgeous stuff that every other person buys and loses money on. We buy the ugly duckling that can then be renovated and, and, and you, it up. And you guys do that as well, right? You we can renovation, do that as well. you manage yeah. property, you like landlord type setup as well. So, so basically people come to us and they don't want to do anything to do with it. So if they've already got their team, they can do that. Otherwise, we can get the mortgage brokers, bank, bankers, financial planners. We can take it through council. So whatever they need to do around residential property, effectively, we can help them. Okay. What do you love about them? I just love talking properly. So I can talk underwater, I can talk at two right. or three in the morning. It's just my normal language in a way. And I've got a passion and when people see on video, then they just see my kind of eyes light up and, and my face. And, and I'd say 90% of what I do these days is for free. So I'm not charging for my time, my client anyway. Mm -hmm. I'd rather deal with the high income earners that have already got the money. They just need to be shown how to do it. Whereas if someone's got no money, no job, no nothing, I'm not a genius, I'm not God, I can't, te I can't create money from mm -hmm. nothing. O other people can, apparently, but I, I definitely know I can't. How, how do you weed them out? So you're giving away a lot for free. Yeah. A, a, lot of a lot of business owners struggle with that. I mean, my whole concept in the Boomerang Effect, my book is around helpful marketing, which is basically understand your, your prospect, what problems and blockages they have, and help them solve it through yeah. giving them, whether it be a giving them information via a podcast or a video or speaking from stage or whatever it is. And this is starting to struggle with that because I feel as though they're giving away their IP, their point of difference, right? But yeah. clearly you and I, we both agree that's not the case and giving yeah. away things for free. Your, your free is interesting. Yours is twofold. One is you're giving it away to people who you know just aren't going to be able to afford to be a client of your empire. Uh, but you're also doing it to build a personal brand and a... Yeah. and an awareness around, oh, if I do want to buy a property and I do have the money, then, then Chris is the guy to speak to. Yeah, because if you're in there for the long term, then you're not after that dollar today. So one of the really big speakers, one of the highest paid speakers in Australia is um, a guy, Craig Rispin, mm -hmm. who took, he's a futurist. a futurist, Yep, he goes and speaks to all the PAs because the PAs, yeah. they're the ones that actually book him. Yep. And so even if I um, help all the, the, I guess the general nation, and they're not my direct customers, they're still speaking to other people that suddenly have got the money. Yeah. And if my reputation around town is, is Chris is great, he gives everything away for free, he helped me in, and I get people coming in off the street saying, hey, I, I heard your seminar 10 years ago, I bought four properties in the middle of places I haven't even heard of, and it's there's no better thing in the world yes. than having someone thank you. And so I'm sure kind of re uh, reciprocity, always the hard word yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what what comes around goes around, and I still want to go to heaven. So all the bad things I do in life, <laughs> then hopefully it balances the uh, the karma out. Well, that decision just to be made, uh, Chris. <laughs> you, um, you you say when I asked what you love about it, you said you, you just love property. Is that 
really the truth or is property the vehicle that's given you the opportunity to live the lifestyle that you love? Is, is the lifestyle that you love or is it property? So kind of half property, half numbers. So... Um, <laughs> no lifestyle. Oh, the, 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 I'm sorry, love, lifestyle's given. Yeah, that's, right. that's a different thing. So my very first speech was to CPA Australia, uh, the accounting body, and it was back in, I don't know, early 2000s, and I had about 700 people. So my first speech ever was to like 700 people. How? And, through Deloitte? Uh, no, it was actually through um, like a networking kind of group or a marketing a of, group. You've been doing a bit of TV and had a bit of profile. Yeah, so I'd done the TV, but I'd never actually spoken before, as in doing a live speech. And to, the first question I asked them is, who thinks you should pay off your home loan? And of course, the accountants, they put two hands up in the air. And, and to spend the next hour trying to convince them that there's an argument not to buy your own home, that the mathematics actually makes sense to rent it instead... Yeah. I love that mental challenge to try and get super clever people to not necessarily change their opinions, but to think, hey, maybe there's a different way of thinking about mm -hmm. things. And we deal with people from school kids up to people worth half a billion, a billion dollars. And again, is I've got one thing that I can talk to them that they don't necessarily know, or it's a different argument they haven't heard before. And I, I haven't created anything new. Mm -hmm. I've just got my own way of doing it. I love having those debates and and yeah, telling clever people that earn half a million, a million dollars that are working their backsides yeah, off eighty hours a week, mortgage. and I'm actually, I'm doing pretty much nothing with a better lifestyle to say, well, working harder actually isn't the way to go. Oh, you are playing Monopoly at eight o'clock in the morning. I think that's, that's <laughs> fairly hard work. Goodness me, I know, this is uh, kids' Monopoly though. Not the real one. <laughs> there you go. And you're brutal, Dad. You're just like you're not going to win, mate. I'm going to, you know. I oh, know it's he. I, I play hard to hard yeah, to, to get, yeah. and yeah, it's fifty fifty. Is uh, he's he's good as well. <laughs> We're chatting with Chris Gray, who is the founder of your empire. I don't even know how to pigeonhole you. A property. Uh, it's a kind of a bars agent, bar, agent, bar, agent, bar expert. Yeah, whatever. Your empire. Are you happy with that name? Every time I say it, I feel like I have to qualify it, saying I'm not talking about your empire. I'm talking about the business. Yeah, because originally. So I don't know anything about marketing, or I, I, well, I don't believe I, sure I do. That. So when we came up with the name originally, that's when the TV show was called My Home, and the agency came up with Your Empire, and I said, no, it shouldn't be Your Empire, it should be My Empire. But I guess it depends. If I'm talking to you, then I'm yes, saying your, your empire, empire, then I'm talking about you. So anyway, I just said, look, if you think that's the right word, then go and do it. I thought it was a bit elitist, building your own castle in the UK. I didn't think it would go down well. But a lot of people seem to love it, so um, yeah, happy to go with the flow. Seems to work here. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. Tell me, um, I want to talk about marketing and how you built this brand, but you do travel a lot. You travel, what did you say, 15 times a year? So roughly 10 or 15 times a, trip, a year with my wife's permission. She's she, we, We've got an agreement for 15 trips is okay. She yeah. knows a lot? Uh, on some of them, yeah. On some of them? So, so, some of them with, with my wife, some of them with the kids, some of them just the, the lads. And then a whole bunch for business and education and learning as well. You travel at the pointy end of the plane. Yeah. And how do you do that? And I haven't paid for a ticket in and five, you six and years. That's right. Yeah, that major yeah. component. It's free. Now, because you actually rang me before the, this interview a few days ago, and I was, it was, I think, six in the morning. I was in Jordan. the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan, just about to get on a camel yes. and have my earpiece on. And um, I mentioned, well, it's all through Amex points. And... I know you said we don't need to mention Amex, and I said I, I completely forgot Amex was a sponsor of the show. But this is what I firmly believe: is I met a guy called Steve Huey from I Fly Flat. Oh yeah, that, he's been on the show. Oh right, okay, cool. And I think I was one of his um, fourth or fifth customers, and I just got it because I used to I used to get a hundred thousand points on my Amex, and convert it to a thousand dollars of Myers vouchers and give it to my wife. So I got no pleasure. <laughs> Then loads of people said they were flying business and first class, and I tried to go on the sites and I just couldn't work out how the hell it all worked. And so that's what Steve's business does. So Steve tells you what credit cards to get, and typically it's Amex because that gives you the most points. He then can work the airline systems to know what routes that you want to take. And sometimes he'll even search for six months to try and find you that flight. And I'm trying to book six or 12 months in advance because I want to get these uh, the right kind of flight. And so, he then teaches me how to get more points out of my business. And um, so effectively, I generate one or two million points a year. So my 10 or 15 flights and, and with my wife as well, then we fly business or first. So I fl flew first to um, 
Jordan and back, which was a 15 hour and a three hour flight. Uh, so what you're doing is putting all your expenses, I mean, every single business expense you can. So my rent, Amex. so again, my staff that aren't staff, they're contractors, effectively I paid them through American Express as well, plus the ATO, plus my <laughs> rent at home, <laughs> plus all my taxes. And so, look, some of those points you've got to pay for. So yes. some people do give you a surcharge, so it's not maybe completely free and you've still got to pay for your uh, taxes on the airlines. But in reality is I wouldn't pay 10 or 20 grand for a first class flight but I don't mind taking one. <laughs> Love it. Let's talk marketing. You said the other day, as you were boarding a camel in Jordan, uh, you said something just off the cuff, marketing should be fun. Yeah. I totally agree. Many, uh, I would hope most people listening to this show think it is fun, because that's why they're listening, but many business owners struggle with it. What do you mean about marketing being fun? This is serious business. And look, I don't think it's just marketing, I think it's business. Business, okay. And look, I'm not sure who I learned it off, but I think there's plenty of mentors out there, like the, the big kind of US kind of guys, that would say it's make, make stuff fun. Um, probably one of my earliest jobs, I actually did recruiting before I joined Deloitte's, and we had to make, uh, I think, 10 connections on the phone every morning and 10 in the afternoon, so 20 a day. And so that meant you probably had to ring 50 people to get connected to... Uh, to that 20 and it's like make it fun take the phone down to the beach or go on a boat or go and do it wherever I, I had a guest uh, years ago Brad Smith who was very big on outbound cold calling yeah. and clearly a lot of people don't like that but what he did with his team was say come in dress up today's outbound cold calling day so guys would come in with mullet wigs and Ray-Ban sunglasses and completely get out of their own heads and be a character and, yeah. and had a real laugh doing it but that's the thing is, that's what you've got to do. You've got to try and turn it into something fun because then ideally there's no difference between work and play. So that's where the earlier comment of my wife might say I work 60 or 80 hours a week or 24 seven. My friends will say I'm doing nothing. But technically is I'm trying to attract high income earners to my business and they either get it or they don't. I'm not gonna get those guys by picking up the phone saying, hey, do you wanna buy a property? But if I'm out at the racetrack or I'm overseas or I'm traveling all the time and people say, Chris, every time I look at Facebook, you're traveling or you're on a boat or you're in a car or you're doing something. And I say, yeah, well, that's that's how it works. So we do lots of events on, on boats. So I've got a, a boat syndicate that I'm a part of. And again, like the I Fly Flat is, don't pay for a whole boat yourself. You pay for an eighth of it because sure. even me, I, I use it a lot and I can't use my 43 days of the year. Hmm. And so we then go and I take... I know someone who could help you with that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, so I take, say, 20 people out on a boat, and I might take a mortgage broker and say, hey, you have your Christmas party on my boat. I then go and get to meet 10 or 15, 20 new people. And I say, if you go out for coffee with someone for an hour, you build a certain relationship. You go and spend four hours playing golf with them, you get an even better relationship and you break down a lot of barriers. You go drinking for 10 or 12 hours on a boat, you break down a lot of barriers. And again, it's not to try and force sell people, but people want to say, well, I hear you rent your boat, or you syndicate your boat, I hear you rent your house, I hear you've got cars that appreciate in value rather than depreciate, I gather you fly for free. And so I want to be known as the person that's got, I guess, all these hacks for all these things to have the million dollar lifestyle without being the millionaire, yeah. and the byproducts properly. You know what you do very well, and you'll probably know this, is that you seed things along the way. So in conversation, you just you just drop, and people go, oh, you're a wanker, and I'm sure you've been accused of that. Yeah, yeah, uh, but with the Lamborghini, the engine noise is so so loud that when people shout, you don't know if they're saying great car or you're an absolute tosser. <laughs> it's a wanker, guys. <laughs> no, I take that back. Um, so, but you're very good, and I think we can all learn from this, is just to see those interesting points. About, yeah, just was in Jordan last week and hopped on a camel, and, and then you move on, and but what do you do that in a calculated way? Maybe you used to. Now it feels like it just maybe flows. a bit fifty fifty. But but what it's doing is, I mean, every conversation you must have, people go, hang, hang sorry, tell me, just yeah. no, 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 and no, let, no. And let, let's go back. They go don't back. get it straight away. Tell yeah. me about that camel, or tell me about how have you got a house with three sixty degree views, or yeah. you're just dropping these little nuggets along the way that people attach themselves to. And that's what excites me, because you'll see my eyes will suddenly yeah, brighten yeah, up, yeah. even on a hangover or something like that, <laughs> because I just love teach. Like, I could never understand at school why anyone would want to be a teacher. It's got to be the worst job in the world. Whereas now, effectively, yeah. I am a teacher and I love it. Yes. 
But so this I, I, is. It's interesting. Can I? I had that uh, discovery a few years ago too. And it's a major reason why I do this this show is is teaching. I mean, there is something very honourable about it, and it's lovely to see other people's eyes light up. And you know. But most people's question is exactly what you said a while ago: is why would you let your secrets out, and why would you give it away for free? If you make so much money from property investing, why would you go and do this? And everyone is sceptical, and, and look, I was an accountant, I'm sceptical on most things. But the reality is is that people do love doing stuff, and they do love doing stuff for other people, for charities and things like that. So that is the reality. If people believe it or not, don't really care. Mm -hmm. But talking about the seeding thing and the marketing, my wife is a, um, a trainer for sales, and every time she hears me having a conversation with a client, she almost throws herself, with 10 stories up, almost throws herself off the balcony. And Deloitte's, my accountant, say the same thing. Because in sales, you're supposed to ask questions. And you're supposed to explore the client. I don't. I'm a teller. You're a storyteller. And I just say, this is what I do. This is what I've got to offer. You either like it or you don't. And that's it. Is that because what you, have, what you do and what you have to offer is very interesting? To most people that I, you want to I, appeal to? I, I don't like selling. And I'm scared of selling. Oh, I and I'm nervous I don't believe it. that. But, and this, the, again, that's the funny that. thing. You love it. And so, but I love it when it goes right. But I You're don't like want to make cold calls. Aren't you like Arthur? You know, <laughs> the binder. Yeah. Hello. I got, got a new motor. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I love selling or leading people that want to be led and want to be sold to. But I can't stand pushing people when they don't want to. So I do a lot of things and I organise lots of events and I'm great if people want to come, but I'm the worst one. If you can't fill a room and for whatever reason it's not going, I'm no good at getting a crowd from one room and putting them in the next room. Mm -hmm. But if, if like people want to be sheep and they, they want a leader, then I can be great at that. You're the man. Yeah. So uh, talking about best marketing, I think you probably answered it, Chris, in terms of the best marketing that you do is, is you tell stories and you're a great networker. You're always looking, no matter where you are, you're looking for that opportunity to strike a conversation. But again, with the... So I'm actually fairly introverted, which again, most people wouldn't believe. Um, but I, like at home, I'm very, very quiet. I, I get that. I, I am too, but like, people wouldn't believe it either. But I, I get that. You kind of... You, when you're on your own... Because I'm outperforming. On. Yeah. You're outperforming effectively. And so where I go into a room, my wife will hit 98 out of 100 people. I hit two, but I have good conversations with them. And that's the thing is, is sure, I can network but I only network with people I like. So if I don't really like a person, I'm not gonna network and build a relationship with them just because I can get business out of it or I can see they can do something for me. I haven't got the time, I've got no interest and I'm almost like, I'll go out there, put myself out there, say all my stuff and be completely open. So I'll mm -hmm. tell them about my personal finances, the rest of it, I don't hide anything. And I'll just hang with the people that are naturally attracted, kind of the low, low hanging fruit in a way. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Two two good conversations is better than ninety eight kind of top level yeah. conversations. If we visited your social media, you touched on it earlier. Uh, are we going to see just a whole lot of lifestyle pics behind the scenes? Here's Chris, you know. Yeah, we... pretty much. We we haven't been great as a business doing social media. Um, a mate of mine's Kerwin Ray. I don't know if you know. He's, no, he's quite a big uh, marketing guy. He was doing a, a social media thing. And he was talking about all the hashtags and how that works in Instagram. Oh, yeah. I've been using it for a few years. I've never used a hashtag. <laughs> I just couldn't be bothered. But he said that's how people sort things yeah, and yeah, the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. So I started trying to put two or three in there. Right. But I'm just, it's not my thing. I, I get on with Facebook. And yeah, it's putting car pictures and experiences, hanging out with mates and, and doing some fun stuff. But um, yeah, I don't think that's my skill base. You said you're pretty open with your numbers. Can you wrap some numbers around where your empire is at? Today, yeah, yeah. 2018. So the the biggest thing is the portfolio. So my portfolio is around 15, 16 million. Um, your your personal my, one? My property portfolio, yeah. So I've got about 13 to 14 properties. I was going to say, in Sydney, that's about two properties. Yeah. <laughs> um, so about 13 to 14, just over a million each. Um, probably about 60% geared or so. So about, say, 10 million of debt. And so I, my philosophy is I believe the market will rise at 5 or 10% over the long term. So I'm banking on making 750 to one and a half million a year and not paying tax because I'm not selling it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's where my real money is. In terms of the business, we turn over roughly one and a half, two million dollars. We might make anywhere from naught to half a million dollars profit depending on the marketing spend, which a lot of it is travel and entertaining, 
not that it's deductible unfortunately mm. um and so i really run that business more as look happy to do it gets me out there it pays for all my living lifestyle property all, all that kind of stuff um and so i had a new guy come in the business that's almost like a ceo now and originally when he came in two years ago he said right let's build it up to five or ten million and we went through all the numbers and went through all the marketing and all those things but two years it's come round. he's actually said well no because even for him the money isn't in the in the business it's again for him is to extract wages or, or income out of it to then turn that into property portfolios mm -hmm. because the business isn't necessarily be that scalable it's not necessarily um, saleable because there's no recurring revenue and so suddenly he's seen how much clients properties have grown in that time and you think well it doesn't make sense and there's nothing better than having someone that really pulls your business apart and comes around to the same conclusion that, that you've got as well. Property prices in Australia, certainly Melbourne and Sydney, but I think nationally have gone nuts over the last few years. Has that impacted your business because there's just not as many sellers and people are holding on knowing that uh, they've got to get back into the market if they sell? Sure. Hello. So yeah. so normally we would have about 10 or 20 customers at any one, any one time that are pre-approved, ready to buy, effectively in a queue. The last three or four years, we've had 50 or 60. Wow. It's been a nightmare. nightmare. So you think it's great, like you've got three times as many clients, but because we're so them. selective, so plenty of other of the competition would buy any old property at any old price. Whereas we're very strict in terms of we'll only buy in blue chip suburbs, we'll buy it based on a bank valuation, which is super conservative, and we can't go, we can't go off that. So we're making our job 10 times as hard mm -hmm. as it, it would be. But I know I can sleep well because I know every single property we bought in 10 years has been on bank valuation. Every single client's made money. Hmm. So there's, no, there's nothing better than walking down the street like that. When's number 60 in that list going to get a property? And that's the problem. And so you then have the conversation with the client to say, look, the market's rising at 10 grand a month and we want to find you a good property, but at the same time, we don't want to rush. And all the clients did actually come back and say, we're not in a rush, we don't want to jump in, we don't want to overpay. Now, some of them didn't end up buying and they, they get a refund, so they pay some of the fees up front and, and we refund 100% if they don't buy. Um, so at least we'd never overpaid for a property. Because if you go and pay 50 or 100 grand over and the market suddenly stops or it does drop five or 10%, suddenly you've got a client that's lost 100 grand. Yep. I'd rather not satisfy them and maybe they're pissed off that we didn't buy but they didn't lose a hundred grand. They didn't lose a hundred grand because I couldn't stand walking down the street saying that guy's ripped me off, or there's a bad online report sure. or something like that. If the worst thing I've ever done to someone is not buy a property, then okay. I, I can live. I can live with that. What do you say? And there's many listening to business owners who are doing the eighty-hour week, who are working their rings off, who are just plain busy and miserable. So I think it depends. There's, there's times that you do have to work that hard. And I've, I've certainly done it through, I mean, you look at my lifestyle, you look at all the properties, it all looks really cool and easy, it's not. Having $10 million worth of debt over you, and I've been in debt since I was 18, is hence my haircut, right? There's, <laughs> there's not too much Boy. air. Yeah. Um, and I say to my wife is that I might not work the biggest hours, and I might not work um, and do millions of calls, but I've got a big weight on my shoulders. I've still got $10 million worth of debt. But even though I'm cash flow neutral now and I've got money in the bank, it's still a weight on my shoulders. And that's effectively what I get paid for. Okay. And so I think at times in my business is I've got back to, to things so bad that I've tried to will on a heart attack because I'm highly insured. So I'll get a good payout. But that was almost my only get out of jail free card. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me so, about the lowest point. So, so that was pretty much it. So um, I probably had two or three times that property doesn't always go up consistently and you get periods that it goes flat for three or four years and you get periods where the banks aren't lending any money and it's really, really tough. Business, as we all know, for like I was doubling my turnover every year, but my first turnover was eight grand. So then you go to 26 and then you go to 50 and 100. So it's doubling turnover, mm -hmm. but you're investing more and more money in the business all the time. So most people in business, it's worse than having a job. It's a bloody liability. Mm. And I make jokes about it that in the um, in the seminars I do is like, uh, when do you ever make any money for business? And people laugh, and you you know straight away who's in business. Yeah, right. Because it's tough. Business mm. is tough, mm -hmm. and you've got to work hard, and there's no option. And so 
I, I almost need this. So I go from feast to famine in a way. And so I suddenly have lots of money. I go and invest it in property and I overbuy too much. So suddenly I've got no money. Then I feel poor. Then I've got to get on the phones and do, do yeah, some right. work. <laughs> and then I go feast to famine, which I'm kind of over that now. Yeah. And so now I'm trying to build my buffer to say, I want 10 years money in the bank so that I don't have to worry about it again. But business is, it's always tough. There's even the biggest businesses around town. Oh, no, it's ups yeah. and down. If you're not on, on the ball all the time and you get too cocky, something changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when are you going to retire? Like literally like take the foot off the pedal and just enjoy what you've created? Yeah, so look, th this year's been a big change. So so I've got uh, a guy, Lewis, in there now who's, who's pretty much running the show. And so this is when both of us said, right, let's cancel mornings. And it really is, I'm only doing stuff if I want it. So we only have clients if we like them. If we don't like them, we're not going to take them How on. How do you establish whether you like a client? Is it immediate kind of intuition? Yeah, I or? think generally you do. Yeah, okay. And if clients, say, become a pain up the backside, sorry if there's any clients out there, yeah. we'll have an honest conversation. If, if they're wanting a million dollar property for 800 grand and they want it within a few days, we won't even take them on in the first place. Mm -hmm. We'll say, look, it's, it's not going to happen. We don't buy properties half price in Bondi, St Kilda, for around all those areas because it just doesn't doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so I think we know because most people, when they're selling clients, they say, "Oh, I'll get you this for half price, and it'll it'll go up at twenty percent a year, and it'll be amazing." We almost undersell what we do, so that then people are saying, "No, no, I still want it." I, I think that that's yeah, the way. Okay. Trying to finish, you you had a book, you've got a book called. Uh, the Effortless Empire. The Effortless Empire. You wrote that a number of years ago. You said you've given away sixty to 70,000 copies. We've had a number of self-publishers on this show, and I say to anyone who listens, I write a book, it's a glorified business card. And if yeah. you can give it away, give it away, because what's it done for your business giving away that many copies? So when I first got into TV, then uh, I got published. So we are going to do a TV show, and uh, the TV show didn't come off, but the book did. And so I was in Dimmux, um, David Jones took all the photos for mum. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing experience. Yeah. Don't think they ever got a royalty check. I'm not sure how many got sold. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole thing, is the kudos of being published. Yes. But then I met an amazing girl, uh, Lisa Messenger, who's oh, yeah. pretty well known around town. And she came up with a concept of, do you want to sell a $25 book or a 25 grand client? And so it was exactly as you say, it's a, basically a brochure. Everyone will throw a brochure in the bin, but not many people will throw a book. Correct. They'll take it to the, the charity store or something like that, or they give it to a friend, or they keep it on the book, bookshelf for five years. They might read it. Yeah, they <laughs> might. And, and we do get people that say, I've had it on my bookshelf for five years, moved house. I should have read it uh, when you gave it to me. Well, I gave it to you. There's not a lot more I could do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's great because it puts it out there. It's powerful, isn't it? And the way we wrote the book was the marketing company listening to 20 client conversations. And every time the client asked a question or I made a point, they wrote down a post-it note. They put them in order for designing the website to say, this is the journey we take them down. And I said, well, that's a book in that. So we actually wrote the book in four hours because it was recorded. And we literally haven't changed a word in 10 years, apart from the average property price, I think 10 years ago was 500 grand, now it's a million, so we've changed, changed mm -hmm. that. Price is doubling every, uh, every seven or 10 years. And it's the best thing because People come to me and I don't want to spend two or three hours with every single person that wants free advice. So I'll say, if you want a meeting, read the book. That's going to answer 98% of your questions. Then if you still want a meeting with me, we can concentrate on the two or three questions that you didn't really understand or the, the few concepts. So there's a reason for them to do it. So now I don't get 100 emails a day or 1,000 phone calls. Mm -hmm. Because most of the people will take the book and say, thanks, I'll go off and read it and go and do it. The other people won't even read the book. And then the ones that do want a meeting have generally read the book or it's been by referral, and so they've probably got a 50 to 80% chance of converting. Genius. Chris, I've got to get back to work, mate. I know you've got to go and check the ice in the boats <laughs> being delivered. Thanks for sharing. My and, pleasure. Uh, it's a great story, and uh, half of me hates you, half of me loves you. Wonderful. Thanks very much. <laughs> Good on you, buddy. Perfect. Really appreciate that. No, you It's a great it's story. Good. It's a no, great good. story. Uh, yeah. We, uh, in fact, I've just got to pause that. Time flies when you do these things, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, you got to. Yeah. That's right. I think it's twelve thirty or something. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We sold property about eighteen months ago and just have not been able to get back into the market. Yeah. Was that down in Melbourne? Yeah, yeah. Complete fuck up. Complete fuck up.
But anyway, got money in the bank. <laughs> but it's it's hard though because you never know if you suddenly the market does change. Because what what kind of price point was it? We sold for one point one. Yeah. So that I mean that's highly competitive then. Yeah. And so that's where probably buying first because you're nearly always going to be able to sell it. Yeah. But if you're at two or three million, you could go and buy and then you're stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no perfect way. I'm kind of resigned to the fact that uh, I'll have to make money elsewhere for the short, <laughs> for the medium term. Anyway, uh, that's great, buddy. Uh, uh, time. If you need to... anything else, uh, just into the city to. Um, do you know EO? Yeah. Yeah, I'm part of EO. So I was in Jordan with EO. Right. So I've got an EO uh, thing.